Department. I think to understand her, she is, even more than Sarah Palin, probably more than any political figure, maybe short of Mike Huckabee, a perfect product of the religious right. Um, you know, she came out of the big fundamentalist or the big evangelical upsurge of the 1970s. Like many evangelicals, including Pat Robertson, was initially enamored of Jimmy Carter, who was the first um, born again, you know, modern born again candidate. Like the movement as a whole, she shifted um, abruptly to the right in the run up to Reagan's election. And she often talks about, in her speeches, what she calls a Christian worldview, which is a really important concept, I think, for people to understand, not just Michelle Bachman, but much of the modern right. It essentially holds that Christianity, or at least their version of Christianity, is a total ideology. It has all the answers, not just to theological questions, but to historical questions, scientific questions, economic questions. Um, and so, you know, what I've tried to what I've tried to get across in writing and speaking about Michelle Bachman is that she's not stupid, um, you know, and she's not Sarah Palin in that she doesn't. She's articulate. She's, I think, a little bit faster on her feet. She's just incredibly steeped in a body of knowledge. That is not. She's incredibly steeped in a in a um, corpus of facts that aren't true facts. She's incredibly steeped in the alternate reality of the movement that I called Christian nationalism in my first book. And so a lot of things that she says, you know, when she, for example, one of her most celebrated gaffes was when she talked about the founders of this country working tirelessly against slavery um, and how, you know, at the dawn of America, it didn't matter what color you were, it didn't matter your economic status. Of course, you know, this is absurd and everybody laughed at it. But if you look at some of, say, the books that she worked on when she was a student at Oral Roberts University, or you look at the whole kind of um, canon of Christian nationalist revisionist history, this stuff is all a truism. And so to a lot of her base, this isn't going to sound like gaffes. This is, this is their reality. What books did she work on? Well, one of the—I I don't know why this hasn't gotten more attention. So when she was at Oral Roberts University, which is, um, you know, kind of a charismatic Pentecostal school in Oklahoma, she was a research assistant to a guy named John Eidsmo, who she still cites as a major influence on her. Now, John Eidsmo is— met, often people in the Christian right are kind of called theocratic. Um, but he is unquestionably a theocrat. He wrote a book that she worked on called Christianity and the Constitution, which argued that the United States was founded to be a Christian theocracy and that it should become one again. Um, he, John Eidsmo is an interesting figure. He's someone who has been asked not to speak at Tea Party, who has been, has had invitations to speak at Tea Party rallies rescinded because of his ties to white supremacist groups and history of advocating for um, Southern secession. Her family doesn't all agree with her. Right. Yes, yeah, she was born in a family of working-class Democrats and became born again in high school, you know, and kind of went on that path on her own. She has a stepsister who's a lesbian who has been—who they were close when they were growing up, and her stepsister has really shied away from the public eye, in part because her father is still married to Michelle Bachman's mother. But the stepsister, Helen Lefebvre, you know, um, there are a couple of other siblings on that side of the family who have been really appalled to see, not just to see Michelle Bachman take the lead on anti-gay, on opposing gay marriage, especially given the fact that Helen and her partner have been together for over 20 years, but also the way that she has kind of distorted family's history, that she claimed at one point to have pulled the nine siblings. Um, it's a blended family with five kids on one side and four on the other. She had claimed to poll them about gay marriage and said that the majority agreed with them, which— With her. W with her, right, which shocked her um, stepbrother enough to go public, because he just said, not only is it not true, but, you know, what a shocking accusation to think about brothers and sisters kind of taking a, a vote about one of their members. And what about her family, um, her kids, her husband? Well, her kids, um, you know, she—her kids have not been that public. I think her older son is sometimes—she sometimes talks about as being one of her closest advisors. She has a, another son who joined um, AmeriCorps, which, as you remember, she at one point talked about as being, you know, part of a kind of sinister campaign to indoctrinate children into one world government. And so we can assume that maybe he doesn't entirely share her fear. Um, 
but her husband is an interesting figure because he's a you know she often talks about how they run a business their business is his christian christian counseling service um it's hard to overestimate what a big role not just anti-gay marriage, but kind of anti-gay politics, period, played in her early political career. And her husband's really a part of that. He's often talked about the need—he's he's called, in, the, in, in some interviews, he's called homosexuals um, barbarians who need to be educated. He says, you know, just because you have certain impulses doesn't mean you need to ask, act on them. He's been associated with, you know, reparative therapy, which can be, obviously, incredibly damaging to people who undergo it and kind of try to change their immutable sexual orientation. Is it, do they raise foster children? I think raise is the, um, the tricky word. You know, she's often says, she often says, as, as recently as this week, she said that she, her, her family has raised 23 foster children. Sometimes she talks about it as if there's, they're all in the house. You know, she'll say, I know the cost of food because I have, you know, 28 children and I go shopping and I have these huge bills. I think there's no doubt that she, she's had foster children and, and that's commendable. But when you say raise, you're, you probably, I think, assume that you're talking about a long period of time. And she had a foster care license for seven and a half years. She, it allowed her to have three children at a time. Everyone I've talked to, including, you know, senior social workers in Stillwater, said that some of these kids she had for—some of them she might have had for more than a year, some of them she had for a couple of days um, or a couple of weeks. I don't know if you could say that somebody who stayed in your house for a couple of weeks, you certainly deserve a lot of credit for giving them shelter. I don't know that you could say that you raised them. The local bloggers in Minnesota have been doing, you know, amazing work on this for years now. And it's amazing to me—I mean, I've written about it a little bit in The Daily Beast. It's amazing to me that this issue hasn't yet broken into the mainstream media, in part because it's, it's not just about Michelle Bachman, it's also about Tim Pawlenty. And one of the interesting things about Frank, about, um, Frank Vaness is that you know, the reason that he was able to kind of insinuate himself into Republican Party politics both was both money, was both financial and ideological, right? He claimed to have found Jesus when he was imprisoned for um, cocaine, for money laundering and cocaine trafficking. And then he came out and having found Jesus and made himself a kind of stalwart of Minnesota's evangelical community, he, you know, kind of cu cultivated all of these powerful allies. And it was because of these powerful allies that he was able to accomplish his fraud. I mean, that's what I think is important, is that when people like Tim Pawlenty and Michelle Bachman say that he deserved to be, you know, readmitted to, readmitted to polite society, that he needed this pardon in order to kind of further his financial career, one of the results of that was to build up his credibility and the, his credibility with evangelicals. Now, his role in the fraud, as Carl said, was to get evangelicals to funnel their money through him. You know, evangelical charities, also some funds that deal with retirement funds for um, pastors and, and ministers. He, he, you know, used his kind of credibility in that community. I think credibility that Bachman and Pawlenty helped him build to channel, you know, many, many millions of dollars from these communities into this massive, massive Ponzi scheme. Yeah, and also, one of the reasons you haven't heard about this Ponzi scheme is that it broke about the same time as Bernie Madoff. So it was really overshadowed, but it was really quite an enormous fraud.